This is Wraith from Wraith Rain. I'm an author of serialized gay romance fiction. Every week on this podcast, I'll be reading a chapter from one of my gay fantasy shifter serials called Dragon's Rain. I'll explain at the break how you can find out more about the story and others I write. So let's get to it. Chapter 24, The Power of Words I cannot believe you talked me into this, Rose hissed into Caden's ear. It was the fifth time she'd said it. He resisted the urge to remind her that this was now mostly her plan, and he'd given her a way out, but she'd insisted on accompanying him. But he already knew that they needed her. He'd asked, and she was, amazingly, a sucker for desperate causes. You're a natural hero, Rose. That's why you're here. I can't take credit for it, Caden said, as he peered over the top of the empty market stall towards where the humans first people were gathering. The closed marketplace and meeting were in a series of narrow, winding streets and alleyways on the edge of the mid. It was considered picturesque. But it wasn't just for tourists. His mother swore by the produce and meat here rather than the commercial supermarkets. Tilly loved coming here for the cool t-shirts and jewelry that the artists that populated the market had. The sense of unfairness that she'd expressed when she hadn't been allowed to accompany them on this mission, as she called it, would have been doubled to know they were here too. But the sellers had long ago cleared out and their empty wooden stalls were left behind for use the next day. Yet they were handy to stay out of sight behind of the human's first people that were clustered in an open-air coffee shop. The shop was open, and most of the people had cups of coffee in their hands, murmuring to each other about various events. Of course, the white dragon was the foremost of all of their conversation. It's smaller than the others. You suppose that means something? One man asked his companion. That just means it might die easier, another responded. Die? Caden's eyebrows lifted. The white dragon spirit frowned and shook its wings in agitation. It did not like this talk of killing. It did not like this talk of dying and hurting. These people were filled with anger and hate. It distressed the spirit. I know, but we have to stay hidden, Iolaire, Caden told it. We have to stop these people from doing more harm. The spirit agreed. It's a bad sign that there's a ninth one now, a third one remarked. That might mean there are more to come. It was going to be hard enough as it was to fight eight dragon shifters. What if there are ten next, or twenty, or thirty? As if they could fight the eight, Caden thought with a trace of annoyance. These people are so crazy. Humans are part of a dying race if we don't do something, a woman added. What? Caden nearly jumped up to shout at her, but he didn't. Really? The only good shifter is a dead shifter, a man muttered darkly from the other end of the room. We just want equal rights. We don't want to kill them, a person retorted. Speak for yourself, the grim man responded. Landry let out a pained gasp. She and Wally were behind the next stall. Caden reached over and squeezed her shoulder. Her brother's weren't the speakers. They were standing beside the lectern that had been set up for Jasper Hawes' arrival. He was to give a speech. Are they really going to have a secret meeting in the middle of the open? Rose muttered. If this is the kind of intelligence we're dealing with, then they'll get caught soon enough, Caden. I don't think they're going to announce their evil doings over the mic, Rose. But people are together, so they're going to talk, Caden said. Wally's rat forms are hidden around the perimeter, listening in. Now, if we had someone who could fly unobtrusively through the crowd or fly above them, Caden looked at Rose meaningfully. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't, Rose muttered as she took a step away from him to shift. This was the part of the plan you agreed with, Caden said. Oh, yes. After you used your puppy eyes on me and your good nature, I couldn't help myself, she reminded him. She was referring to the conversation they'd had at lunch after Wally had given her a job. So at first, it had been celebratory. She'd actually been smiling, even though they were at Jane's. Caden had tried to discourage her from going there. He told her to pick any place in the mid for lunch, but she had read into why he tried to veer her away from the bakery. She doesn't like shifters, Rose had guessed. 
No, Kate admitted almost sheepishly as if he were responsible for Jane's prejudice. But the truth was that he wanted Rose to have a good experience in the mid today so that her pessimism wouldn't grow. Then we're most definitely going there. I am in a good mood, but I must remind myself that most people are not like you, Tilly and Wally. Most people are garbage. Let's go. Rose had then firmly walked to Jane's bakery, parked herself at one of the tables outside and opened a menu. Jane had at first stayed inside her shop, looking at them, then away, as if she hoped that they would leave before she had to ask them to. Tilly frowned as she watched this strange behavior. I think, uh, I don't think Jane is going to take our orders, Caden said quietly. We should go somewhere else. I know a ton of better places. They're all the same, Caden. Swarm shifters are not welcome. So we might as well stay here where we are and make her do something. I am scaring off her other customers, by the way, Rose replied, not looking up from her perusal of the menu. Chicken salad and a brioche sounds quite good. The brioche is homemade, right? It is, Caden said. He glanced up and saw that Jane was staring at them with dismay. Tilly suddenly rose from the table. I'm hungry. I'm getting Jane. Till. Caden, she's racist, Tilly hissed. She is? So she's not going to react well to you calling her out. You shouldn't have to go through this, Caden said. Rose lowered the menu and took a hold of Tilly's arm. He's right, Tilly. I... I don't want you exposed to this. Maybe we should order to go and eat in the shop. No, Rose, this isn't right. I'm not going to let Jane treat you this way, Tilly cried. And Caden was on his feet. He didn't realize he was doing it. Everybody sit down. I'll be right back. He was in the store before either of them could say anything in response. Jane nearly jumped when the bell above the door rang as he stepped inside. He knew that she thought he was a human and therefore she would treat him differently than she would any shifter. Yet he could feel Iolaire blazing with as much indignation and righteous anger as he was. He was certain that the spirit could be seen in his eyes as he marched over to the counter. Why aren't you coming outside to take our order, Jane? He asked point blank. Oh, because I was. She gestured lamely at a washcloth on the counter that she hadn't touched since they sat down. The counter can wait to be washed, can't it? He picked up her order pad and handed it to her along with a pen. We'd like to order now. She took it from him in weak hands and opened her mouth to speak, then shut it again, then opened it once more. I really, um, really don't. Do you see that young woman with Tilly? Her name is Rose. She helped me yesterday after the explosion. She's working at Wally's, just hired. This is her celebratory lunch. I told her how good your food is, he said. Oh, Jane licked her lips. I didn't think that they allowed mm, certain people um, here. Jane, if you are afraid of Rose because she's a swarm shifter, I can assure you that there's no reason to be. She's kind, if a little outspoken, sort of like you, he said with a faint smile. She's not going to hurt you. It's not that, Jane's eyes lowered to the counter. Not just that. Shifters are, well, they're one thing. But swarm shifters are quite another. The type of spirit joins with the same type of human. And swarm shifters are always, well, you know how they are. No one knows for sure why a spirit joins with a human. But let's pretend you're right. Rose is a bee shifter. She can pollinate flowers. She's good for gardens. If a bee stings you, it does so because it is afraid of you. So afraid that it dies after that one sting, he told her. Does that sound evil to you? Jane looked down at the counter. No, but... But she must be, mustn't she? I'm telling you, she's not. Come out and meet her. Find out for yourself, he said. I don't need to meet her to know that I don't want her kind here, Caden. She looked at him almost helplessly. I love you and Tilly, but she's scaring people away from the business. She's, she's, well, I just can't. I'm sorry. Any other time you and Tilly come. How old does Rose look to you? He asked, not wanting to hear more along that line. His temper might get ahead of him and simply screaming at her might feel good, but it would change nothing. 
He was likely foolish and naive to think that Jane could change, but he held onto that thought that she could. Oh, I- I'm not sure, Jane said. Shifters are ageless, aren't they? They stay the same age as when they bond with the spirit. So when Rose bonded with her spirit, how old was she, do you think? He pressed. Nineteen, maybe? Perhaps a little older, but not much, she guessed. Your niece Anna is that age, right? He asked. Well, yes. Could you imagine Anna sitting out at a cafe, not being served because she was a shifter? Jane's eyes widened to the size of saucers. Anna would never be a a what? Someone that could spread life? Someone that's brave enough to help others? Someone that could somehow deal with the fact that everyone is afraid of her, loathes her, and moves when she walks by? Someone that people are prejudiced against before she even opens her mouth? He asks, his hands fisting at his sides. That sounds very hard, but... But what? Rose is a good person. Whatever you think you know about shifters isn't true, Jane, he said. But how you treat shifters, how you treat Rose, will show the truth about you. He let that sink in a minute. I'm going to go outside. If you're not out there in five minutes to take our order, we'll leave and never come back. You and Tilly are always welcome, just no, Jane. Tilly and I will never come back. Not ever. Because while you only think you know bad things about Rose, I'll definitely know bad things about you. It's your choice. I really hope what I learn about you in the next five minutes is something good. But that's, that's all up to you, he said and turned away, not waiting for an answer. The bell tinged again as he exited the shop and went to the table to sit down. He noted the time. Five minutes. He would not look in the shop window. He was shaking a little. Tilly and Rose stared at him. What did you say, Caden? I wanted to go listen, but Rose stopped me. Tilly rolled her eyes. I gave her a chance to show who she really is, Caden said, feeling like those words were a little dramatic, but realizing that they weren't as well. You gave her some kind of ultimatum, didn't you? Rose cocked up one eyebrow. Five minutes to serve us or none of us will ever come back, he confirmed. There were four minutes left now. Rose shifted uncomfortably in the wrought iron seat. Look, this is my fault. I don't want you to have to not come here just because of me. This owner isn't any worse than anyone else. Swarm shifters have a rep, you know? So maybe we should just... Caden put a hand on Rose's arms. Look. This isn't just about you. When she gave him a look, he quickly added, not just about you. It's about not being blind anymore to this. I can't sit back any longer and... And you think a few well-spoken words, or stumbly ones in your case, are going to change someone's views? Rose shook her head. God, Caden, I don't know if that's sweet or arrogant or just foolish. You think you can change the world? Three minutes left. Caden scrubbed his face with his hands. Maybe Rose was right. Well, partially right. Maybe a lawyer like his father or someone really well-spoken could reach Jane. But him? Before yesterday, when Irelair chose him for some unknown reason to bond with, who had he been? A shop clerk, with no ambition and no real chance of going far. Now, here he was, trying to champion shifter rights. Irelair frowned at him, not liking these dark thoughts. Maybe you should have talked to Jane, he suggested to the spirit. And that's another thing. I get to hide behind speaking to Jane about Rose when I'm not telling Jane that I'm one of the people she despises. Iolair ruffled its wings. Its blue-eyed gaze was impenetrable. There was meaning there, if only he could understand it. One minute left. I hope you were enjoying Dragon's Reign so far. Now, you can tell I love shifters, and Dragon's Reign was the first serial I had a whole world of them, all different types, but I've also done the more traditional shifter tales involving werewolves, and one of those is a modern gay retelling of Little Red Riding Hood in my serial, Crimson. In Crimson, a lonely young man finds love in a werewolf pack. Gareth, alpha of the Cold Moon pack, does not believe in mates. His friend went mad after his mate was killed, so Gareth resists love. But then he meets Jude Connor. Growing up an orphan, Jude experienced human cruelty and trusts no one. 
Still, he dreams of belonging to someone and being part of a family. Can he bring himself to trust Gareth and the Cold Moon Pack and make that dream a reality? If you'd like to check out the first few chapters of Crimson for free, the link is down in the description below. I'm afraid we're likely never going to have any of Jane's fresh baked goods anymore, Till. I sort of made that threat, he said to his sister. I don't want to eat here if they won't serve Rose and you anyways, Tilly cried. God, you're as sweet as your brother. My bee form would just buzz all around you, Tilly, Rose said with a smile as she reached out and ruffled the girl's hair. Tilly giggled. Time was up. With his heart feeling like it had calcified in his chest, Caden stood up and tried for lightness as he said, Well, there's this great Asian place. You aren't going anywhere, are you? Jane's voice came from the doorway. She was shouldering it open as she had a pitcher of lemonade in one hand and a basket of her best light as air rolls in the other. Sorry for the wait, but I had to get these rolls out of the oven. Fresh is far better. Tilly jumped up and held the door for her. Jane smiled her thanks. You've brought a uh, a new customer to my shop, so I have to show off my best, Jane said as she came and sat both the pitcher and the rolls on the table. Steam rose up from the rolls. There was a cup of her famous butter mixed with cheese that was already melting just from being near the steaming rolls. She pulled out the pad and pen. Laminated rolls are on the house, but would you like anything else? Why don't you go first, dear? She addressed that comment to Rose, who had likely never been called dear in her life. Rose swallowed and said, I, I really like chicken salad. Do you-, do you recommend yours? Oh, yes, it's my favorite, too. And the brioche is so buttery, you'll really like it, Jane pattered. She was nervous. Her cheeks were red. She was talking too fast. She looked like she wanted to be anywhere else but there. But she'd come out. She'd done it. Caden sat down, feeling a bit numb. He hardly remembered ordering his favorite club sandwich on toasted whole wheat. He didn't even hear Tilly order her ham sandwich on a pretzel roll. Coming right up, Jane said too brightly and raced back inside. Tilly began pouring out the lemonade into their glasses. They were all quiet for about five minutes. Taking a deep swallow of her drink, Rose's eyelids fluttered shut. So good. I know, right? Tilly had drunk half of hers already. I'm so glad that Jane isn't a racist. Or that she's trying not to be. Damn you, Caden. I was all set to hate humanity today and you've just ruined it. Rose clinked her glass against his. Caden gave out a half laugh. I don't think it was me. I think it was her. She's not stupid. Logic can reach people, even if it's coming out all stumbly. I do not want to swell your head, Rose said soberly, but I have to say something. Oh boy, what? He looked at her nervously over the glass of lemonade. Just that I'm totally seeing why the white dragon spirit chose you. He sputtered while Iolair cooed. Don't let that go to your head, Rose smacked him lightly on the temple. Ow, I won't. I can't even believe it worked, he said, but he noticed that people were staying away from Jane's shop, staring over anxiously at Rose. Rose touched his hand. One person at a time, hero. You can't change the world in a day. Um, how would you feel about giving two more pretty racist humans a second chance? He asked her, feeling this was the prime moment to talk about Landry's brothers, Ross and Harvey. I'm totally going to forget that comment about the spirit choosing you, aren't I? She scowled at him. Oh yeah, totally, he grinned back. He then explained to her about how Landry's brothers might have been behind the bombing, or at least the smoke bombs, and his desire to find out which. One of her eyebrows had crawled up into her hairline. The other one had joined it when he had asked her to help them do this. I want to help too, Tilly enthused. How about no, Rose told her, you are getting nowhere near a human's first group. They're bad for humans and shifters. Caden tried to stop beaming at how big sister and protector-like Rose was already being to Tilly. Rose, who claimed to like nobody and no one liked her. It was awesome. But you'll help me, Caden asked hopefully of Rose. She had sliced one hand through the air. Help you prove some bastards and humans first shouldn't go to jail? Even if they didn't plant the bomb, why would I want to help them? She asked sharply. Those guys want to kill me or imprison me or worse. They make Jane's racism look like politeness. Because we can't let the wrong people be blamed for this, Caden responded simply. This could start a second war between humans and shifters. The shifters would win. 
Rose continued to scowl. Yeah, likely. But what would happen to the humans? How do you think they'd be treated afterwards? Do you want Tilly to be put into ghettos like Valerian does with the humans in his territory? He asked her. No, but Valerius wouldn't do that. Marban says for all his bark, Valerius really doesn't want to bite, she said, but looked uneasy. So nothing would happen to Tilly. You sure about that? So you want Shefters to be responsible for planting the bomb? How is that any better? Rose asked. He had told her about the young girl he had seen with the nightshine in her eyes who had been carrying the backpack. No, of course not. But if the wrong people are judged for this, the real perpetrators will keep on hurting people, he told her. If we can make sure that only the guilty people are prosecuted for this in a court of law, not by a mob, we could potentially bring the humans and shifters together. We could show that it was just this individual or group of people who was responsible, not the whole other side, Gain explained. There are people who break the law all the time. It's not because they're humans or because they're shifters. It's because they're bad people. You know that most people aren't going to make that distinction, Caden, right? I mean, they're going to be smart people who will figure that out. Rose, though, shook her head. For every Tilly and you out there, there will be people like my mom and dad and Jane who will still see things in black and white, human or shifter. You didn't think I could convince Jane to serve us, he told her quietly. You didn't either, she pointed out. He sighed. Well, we were both wrong. Look, most people get scared when they encounter something they don't understand. And when they get scared, they attack. But if you can reach them and stop their fear, they won't attack. Caden, this is so above my pay grade. She tilted her head back. Is this something I have to do to keep my job or our friendship? I mean, I know I owe you, but this? No, of course not. You don't owe me, Rose. I'm asking because honestly, we could use the help, Caden told her. The ability to shift into little bees that could go into their meeting and listen? That's pretty damn awesome. It's not like I can shift into my dragon form and hang out there. I could help too, Tilly cried again. I'm small. No one would suspect me of being a spy. No, no, both Rose and Caden said at the same time. Tilly's shoulders drooped and she glumly ate her sandwich. You guys are no fun at all. Yeah, anyone who considers infiltrating a human's first meeting as fun is definitely not going, Caden said firmly. Fine, Tilly sighed and chewed the pretzel roll. Rose, forget I asked. Wally Landry and me can handle it. I shouldn't have put you in this position, Caden said suddenly, as glum as his sister. I swear to God that you were too good to be true. She muttered to the ceiling before she lowered her head and turned to look at him face on. If you really are as good as you seem, I should be trying to protect you from yourself, Caden. Certainly not letting you go into humans' first meetings. Look, I hate the police and the claw, but you should go tell them what you know about Landry's brothers and leave it at that. Let them handle it. Do you really think that the Claw or the police will give Landry's brothers a fair shot? He asked her. Now that sounds very pessimistic of you, Caden. I would expect you to be saying that they would give them a just hearing. I'm afraid I'm infecting you with some common sense. She gave him a lopsided smile. No, I don't think the police or Claw will act right out of a sense of justice, but I think they will act rightly out of self-preservation. What do you mean? Caden asked. They need to know who's really doing this. Because like you said, leaving the real bad guys out there means more bombs, she explained. So they will look farther than just Landry's brothers. I'm pretty sure those guys will still be going to prison, but the police and Claw won't stop investigating. They'll want to find out how deep the rot goes. I will tell Valerius about this, but only after I check it out myself. Landry is one of my best friends. I can't. Caden pressed his lips together as he tried to find the words to encompass his feelings on the matter. She'll never forgive herself if she's responsible for her brothers going to jail for something they didn't do. Rose ran her fingers through her yellow and black hair. And you were loyal too. What a surprise. I'm not a saint, Rose. I'm just her friend, like I'm your friend. And that's why I am telling you now that you don't have to come with us. Like I said... I probably shouldn't have even asked, he said. But you need me, she said simply. Wally might have been some big criminal mastermind back in the day, but he hasn't been an operative in a long time. That's what I do. His eyebrows crept up into his hairline now. Operative? 
Operative sounds so cool. Tilly breathed. She dropped her sandwich and was staring at Rose with open admiration. Operative, infiltrator, spy. Rose waved a hand through the air as if it were no big deal. You need people that are used to being small and insignificant and unnoticed, but who hear and see everything to fill those roles. I can tell you that's been me for a lot of years. The last thing I would describe you as small, insignificant, or noticed, he told her. That's only because I'm not trying to be, but I can blend in, she explained. So where is this humans first meeting going on and what's your plan? And he had told her. And then she had told him that his ideas had sucked. And then they had made a better plan, which had brought them here. All right, all right, time to get my bee on, she grumbled, but she sounded a little bit excited about it too. She went behind another stall to strip out of her clothes, because even in the night-shrouded market, he could see as easily as if it were high noon. Not that he would have looked, but still, he gave her privacy. Though when he heard the soft buzzing, he did turn, and his eyes widened. Landry let out another gasp. There was a tower of bees, as large as Rose had been. They swirled like a bee tornado, moving as one. His lips parted in awe as the bees flew up to the ceiling and like a fluttering silk scarf, moved along it until they reached the alleyway in open air. They then spread out and became impossible to see in the dark. That was beautiful and scary, Landry whispered. He nodded. Glad she's on our side. Landry nodded back. She gripped his hand, though suddenly. He turned to look where she was facing. A well-dressed man had just gone to the lectern. It was Jasper Hawes. He smiled like a model for a crust commercial and raised his hands in the air to stop all the hooting and hollering and applause for his appearance at the event. It's good to see such an excellent turnout tonight, he said to more applause, his eyes narrowed. But then again, movements gain more power when they take action instead of simply saying words. Caden's heart fell. Jasper's words indicated that humans first was behind the bombing. Landry's brothers were in such big trouble, and maybe the world was too. I hope you enjoyed this week's chapter. If you want to read ahead in Dragon's Reign or read the many other stories hosted there, you can purchase a membership to get access to wraithrain.com. Or you can continue to listen along here for free. If you'd like to learn more about WraithRain.com and me, there's a link in the description down below. 